Welcome to Dialogue Across Difference, an event series hosted by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Join us as Center Director Larry Jacobs and guests engage in conversations across the political and policy spectrum on issues of the day. Good afternoon. I'm Larry Jacobs. I am a professor here at the Humphrey School at the University of Minnesota. I want to welcome you to this uh, terrific conversation. Uh, we've got a live audience here of people, uh, but we've also, I know, have a number of people joining us online, and it's good to have you with us. Um, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the uh, Power of American Deterrence and Commitment to Freedom. This is part of a series that Vin Weber and I have put together of conservative voices uh, here at the University of Minnesota. Um, and it stems from our collective interest in making sure that there's intellectual diversity here at the University of Minnesota. This is our third program. And the other two um, are online. The first was with um, uh, Ramesh Ponaru, who's an editor at the National Review. And the second was with uh, Secretary Amy Gadera, who's the Education Secretary at uh, uh, the state of Virginia, uh, where she's been a prominent national voice for uh, the reform efforts to increase uh, rights and freedom for parents. Um, so it's just wonderful to have you here today. And I want to uh, welcome uh, my, my collaborator, Vin Weber, to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Larry. Uh, I am Vin Weber. I won't make, uh, take a lot of time because I know we want to get right to our speaker, but it's a special pleasure for me to introduce uh, my friend, Steve Hadley. Uh, Steve is, in my view, one of the preeminent foreign policy thinkers in the Republican Party, certainly out of his generation and mine. Uh, he was the national security advisor in the second Bush administration, also served in the first Bush and Ford administration. So a long history and a distinguished history. And welcome to Minneapolis, Steve. Great to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Um, Steve, maybe I could just jump right in. Um, you know, there's some people who are looking around the world and think we might be in the cusp of World War III. Uh, maybe it's hyperbole, but, you know, the situation with Russia in the heart of Europe invading Ukraine, um, some think that Russia's got aims on invading Poland and threatening other um, countries in Europe and even Western Europe. You've got China, uh, which is seen as a real threat um, in, in, the, in its neighborhood. Uh, particularly with regards to Taiwan. Uh, then you've got the Middle East, which um, we've had three administrations in a row who talked about rebalancing out of the Middle East, but now it's right back in the middle of our, our thinking. Are we on the cusp of World War III? Well, one, one never knows, but I don't think so. But it is interesting that that issue is now being raised. I saw an article about a month or so ago. Someone said, you know, well, World War II started with three separate conflicts. Italy went into Ethiopia. Uh, Hitler re-militarized the Rhineland and then moved, began to move west. And of course, Japan went into Manchuria. Three separate conflicts that were simmering for a while and then merged into World War II. That could happen. I think there's a lot of reason to think if we do the right thing along with our friends and allies, that does not need to happen. So let's take them sort of one at a time, just briefly. Putin clearly has got an agenda. His agenda is to restore not the Soviet empire, but the Russian empire. And he has talked about restoring Russia control over traditional Russian lands. The bad news is those traditional Russian lands happen to be in the Baltic states, Poland, Slovakia, uh, and, and, and the like. Uh, if, in fact, it, it all begins for Putin by taking over Ukraine, because that is the cornerstone, Ukraine and Belarus would be the cornerstone of a new consolidated Russian empire. If we are able to stand with the Ukrainians and prevent Russia from absorbing Ukraine, I think that will make it very difficult for Russia, whatever Putin's aspirations, to initiate conflict with the Baltic states or with Poland. 
Uh, Middle East is trickier, but I think what the administration is trying to do is to forge an alliance really between Israel and the Sunni Arab states, which could provide a solid front against Iran and Iran's proxies, which are active in Yemen and Syria and Iraq and Lebanon and of course on the, the Gaza Strip. Um, that it seems to me is a doable proposition. It requires a lot of diplomacy. It is gonna require Israel to decide that they're gonna give some space to the prospect for a Palestinian state. Otherwise you won't get Saudi Arabia probably to do a sort of Abraham type accord with, uh, with Israel. But it's a, so it's tricky diplomacy will take some time, but it's not necessarily the case that Iran is gonna overwhelm the Middle East. And finally, China, I think, you know, has aspirations to unify with Taiwan, aspirations in some sense to take the South China Sea and turn it into the Great China Lake. Um, uh, again, we have our active diplomacy and actually an actual military presence with our friends and allies to both try to deter China from doing something militarily against Taiwan and to challenge its sovereignty over the South China Sea. I think if, again, if we work closely with our friends and allies, it's possible that, that that deterrence will work. And China also has a lot of incentives not to have a conflict with the United States. Xi Jinping has made a lot of promises to his people about where China is gonna be as a developed con economy and ultimately a, a, a com country on the first rank of the world stage. He can't deliver on those promises if he goes to war with the United States. So it could happen, three very challenging situations, but again, with the right policies and with working closely with friends and allies, we have options to avoid that outcome. Um, faced with all of this, we actually have, a, in, in inflation adjusted terms, a declining defense budget. That's not reconcilable with meeting the challenges that you presented to us today. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of resources we should be devoting to national defense? And maybe more importantly, where we should be putting them? Because, you know, unsophisticated people like me just think about tanks and mortars and things like that. Where should we be? What we should, should we be investing in? Well, it's very hard. And, you know, I take your point, Vin. The, uh, there are a lot of people writing, my friend and colleague Bob Gates has said, this is the most challenging international environment we face since the height of the Cold War. Well, do you remember in the height of the Cold War, we were spending five or 6%, maybe 7% of our GDP on the defense budget. We're not doing that now. We're at under 3% and declining, as you point out. And a lot of our friends and allies in Europe at 1% straining to reach 2%. So we have this disconnect between what we feel to be a really seminal and challenging geopolitical moment and the resources we're putting into it. Our defense resources are stretched because one, we have obligations that we've undertaken to support the Ukrainians. We have obligations with respect to Israel to provide weapons and support to those countries in the face of the challenges they face. But we've also got to refit our own military. We spent the first two decades of the 21st century fighting basically counterinsurgency and counterterrorism operations. That requires one kind of training, one kind of set of force capabilities. The kind of wars that we're seeing in Ukraine or the kind of war that would could threaten Taiwan would be a very different kind of war. So our military has to refit in terms of training, doctrine, and weapons. And we also have to rebuild our defense industry, which since the days of the Cold War has really atrophied and is straining to meet the requirements of the current moment, which is meeting what we have to owe to both Israel and to Ukraine and to refit our own forces. So we're not ready for the kinds of conflicts we might face. And therefore, we're not in a good position to deter those conflicts, which is, of course is the whole point of why you spend money in your defense budget is to deter conflicts so you don't have to use those resources. And yet we've got a, a domestic situation, as we're seeing in Congress right now, where there's competition over the budget. And there are you know, smart people who are warning that our deficit uh, is, is far too high. 
Uh, we've got folks in the business community and the financial markets already reporting that it's become more difficult to float uh, U.S. Treasury bonds because of the deficit um, and where it's heading. So how, do, how does America meet what you see as the rising defense needs and expenses uh, while uh, becoming more fiscally prudent at a time when Republicans are divided, Democrats are divided, um, and there doesn't appear to be a clear national security uh, direction that we're unifying behind? Well, uh, all good questions. And we're not, I think the bottom line is we're not well positioned to deal with the challenges we face. And one of the things that Gina Raimondo, who's our Secretary of Commerce, has been saying, uh, and she's very rightly been saying, is economic security is national security. That our, econo our economy is the foundation for what we can do in terms of national defense and meeting national security challenges. That message needs to get more broadly understood. And people are gonna have to recognize that we have a huge fiscal cliff out there that we're not paying attention to. Uh, interest on the national debt, which we are now having to pay, is actually larger than the amount of money we're putting into our defense budget. And it's gonna get worse rather than gets better over the next five to 10 years. So we, we've been sort of hiding our head in the sand about our fiscal challenge that we face. A lot of these issues and, and are, have to do with entitlements and the need for entitlement reform. And both parties are treating those, that issue as kind of a third rail of politics. That's gotta end. I would argue, and I'm you need to get some economists up here to talk about it, but I would understand, uh, argue that we've known for a long time what to do about Social Security. For those who are not in the program, you got to increase the retirement age. You got to change the way you do inflation. Maybe you need to adjust some benefits while keeping faith with those who are already in the system and who paid into the system. It's not rocket science. I would argue that in terms of our border, in terms of immigration, in terms of a lot of our problems, we've known the solutions for the last 10 or 20 years. We just have not had the political consensus to, for Republicans and Democrats to come together and have bipartisan solutions that are sustainable across parties. We've fallen into this cycle that Republicans come in, they enact a set of policies which, when the government switches to the Democrats, they unwind and institute their own policies, which the next Republican administration then undoes. That is not a way a responsible power is gonna address the domestic challenges we face. And this fiscal crisis is one that the political system is gonna to have to start grappling with. That's, if I can editorialize on that, and the, the entitlement thing, it, it drives me crazy. It, it seems to be the one thing that Biden and Trump agree on is that we can't touch entitlement programs. You know, way back in the 80s when I was in Congress, we did much of what you just talked about, Steve. We we raised the retirement age and we increased payroll taxes on self-employed people. And I can tell you, no Democrat wanted to raise the retirement age and no Republican wanted to raise the payroll tax, but we knew we had to do it. But the, the message out of that, I would say to these, as you described it, to the, this is the third rail to people, no one lost their seat in the next election for having voted for that. The, the, the American people have been convinced that when we talk about reforming entitlements, you are going to slash their social security check next month. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what's necessary. The reform can be achieved and it will not paralyze, paralyze people. And I would say, and you're the practicing politician, so I defer to you on this one, but Everyone says it requires leadership. It does require leadership top down. It requires a president who's willing to take on these challenges and explain to the American people why they have to be addressed. But also the American people have to demand it. They've got to basically say, start saying to elected representatives, we want you to work across the aisle and come across with solutions. And if you don't, and if you play partisan politics and on our nickel, we're going to vote you out of office next time. So the American people have some responsibility in this, in this too. Um, Steve Hadley, let me uh, get us back to national security. Um, we obviously have an uh, election heading up, um, and there's been a lot of criticism of the Biden administration. Um, we've got, uh, you know, a series of chapters, the decline in President Biden's approval rating, 
really seems to be timed to the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan. We're now involved in um, supporting Ukraine in the heart of Europe um, in a way in which European nations are not putting in that those kind of resources. Uh, we're engaged in a really uh, quite unstable um, situation of supplying military support to Israel, um, while also trying to put conditions on it that seems to have confused some of our allies. Uh, and then there is a lot of debate about how we should be supporting Taiwan in the face of uh, military threats from China, including overflights and, and naval um, actions that, that could look threatening. So my question to you is, has the Biden administration um, done a really poor job? Would you give them a grade uh, on how they've done uh, in handling the country's security? Look, uh, I have to say that, you know, I, this is probably one of the most challenging situations the nation has faced since maybe the Cold War, maybe since World War II. These are not easy problems. And anybody who tells you they are doesn't really understand them. Um, obviously, the withdrawal from Afghanistan was a terrible signal about American resolve and commitment. Yes, it's been a long time war, but it was not a forever war. For American men and women in uniform, that war ended in 2011, 2012, 2013 under the Obama administration. We were due at a different strategy. It was Afghan soldiers that were fighting the terrorists and the Taliban in Afghanistan, not American soldiers. So we have this narrative about forever wars, which is really not an accurate description of where we were, but still, the pulling out of Afghanistan and the way it was done without consultations with friends and allies was a real mistake. And it raised questions about American credibility and staying power. And you can decide what impact that had on Putin's decision to go into Ukraine or what effect it's having on China as they think about Taiwan. So it was a rough start for the administration. I think now, one of the things that's interesting about it is that with respect to all three of those crises you described, what America is being called upon to do is to train, assist, and provide uh, military support to friends and allies, but not to put our own troops on the ground or in harm's way. And that is the case in Israel, which is defending itself, in Ukraine, which is defending itself, and Taiwan, which wants to become more resilient in the face of Chinese pressure. That's a good formula for the American people. Um, and and it's, uh, it's I think it's the right approach to those conflicts. But they are very difficult. And I think a couple of things are, are clear. One, we have to clear about our commitments. Two, we need to commit the resources to make clear that we are supporting our friends and allies in those three con con conflicts over the long term. Because Putin thinks he can wait us out. Putin thinks that that American and European support for Ukraine will wane over time, and that would demoralize the Ukrainian forces, and that will open the door for him, basically, to turn Ukraine first into a failed state, and then basically a part of, of Russia. But is he wrong? I think it will depend. I think the answer is probably he is wrong. And, you know, we talked about these Europeans not putting the kind of money into defense they probably should until this latest bill was enacted by the Congress, providing some 60 plus billion for Ukraine, the Europeans actually had put in both more economic support and more military equipment support for Ukraine than the United States. So they've stepped up in a pretty good way. Mm -hmm. There are political challenges in Europe. There are political challenges in the United States. The, the role of the president is to manage those political challenges. Um, so I think there is a there is a good prospect that we can prove them wrong, but we need to commit the resources. And then we need to maintain this close tie with our friends and allies. Uh, we, I would argue, there are questions that can be raised about whether the United States alone could manage all three of these crises. You know, if you go back to World War II, we emerged from World War II, the United States had 50% of global GDP, think about that. 50% of global GDP, where now they're somewhere around 20. But if you add 
our 20 to what our friends and allies have, we've got the economic power, the diplomatic power, and the military power to manage these crises. But it's hard. It requires resolution. It requires mm -hmm. smart policies. It requires building consensus at home between, behind those policies and keeping our fr friends and allies engaged in the effort. Um, I listened to General Richard Breedlove several months ago talk about Ukraine. And I'm very glad that we're supporting Ukraine. And I'm disappointed in many in my party that aren't. But General Breedglove did make a point, uh, critical of the Biden administration. He said, the president has never articulated clearly that our goal is to have Ukraine win. Do you think that, do you, do you share that criticism and do you think it's important? Uh, I, I, I do. And I we, we had a little conversation, chance to talk uh, in the last hour. But one of my favorite stories is a conversation I had with President Bush, who tells you the problem. Um, President Bush would give a speech a week on the war on terror. Why it was important? Why was it important to Americans back home? What was our strategy and why we were going to succeed? And, you know, at one point I had the temerity to say, Mr. President, why don't we give a speech on something other than the war on terror? He said, well, like what? I said, well, give a speech on your Afri Africa policy, HIV AIDS and all those wonderful things you're doing. The American people know nothing about. He said, OK, but put a little tail on there about the war on terror. So we gave him a great speech on Africa with a tail on the war on terror. And 20 drafts later, it was a speech on the war on terror with a tail on Africa. And I said, Mr. President, what's the point of giving this speech? And he, of course, said, Hadley, you don't get it, as I said before, something he said to me fre frequently. He said, no, Mr. President, no, I, President, I don't. He said, when you have American troops engaged overseas, and I would broaden it to say, when you are making a major exertion overseas, as we are on behalf of Ukraine and Israel, and potentially with respect to Taiwan, you've got to talk to the American people all the time. Because Americans are naturally isolationists. They care about things here at home, and that's the right thing to do. we got problems here at home. We need to address them. But at the same time, what happens overseas can affect the security and prosperity of Americans here at home. And the president's job is to explain to the Americans why engagement overseas is in our interests, affects our interests and in economic prosperity here at home and our security here at home. Why we're committed, what our strategy is, that showing resolution that we're going to succeed. Our friends to hear it, our enemies need to hear it, the American people need to hear it. And I would say that this is not something the last couple of administrations have done effectively. Well, you you uh, you know made a quite a list for the next president. You know they've got to be resolute. They've got to engage Americans and our allies. We've got to commit the forces and the money. Is Donald Trump up to that? Uh, I think I think either of these candidates are uh, are up to it if they commit to it. You know, it's a great, the president of the United States, despite all the distractions of social media and all the rest, the president of the United States still has the biggest meg megaphone in the business. But you got to be willing to pick it up and talk through it. And I think both of these presidents could do it. The question for the American people is whether, which one is likely to be, both be more willing to do it and more effective at it. That's one of the questions before the American people. Can I switch over to China for just a minute? Um, one of the things that that you hear from people who are not pessimistic about the Chinese situation is that China is in decline. Their economic growth rate has begun to collapse or at least substantially uh, slowed. Mm -hmm. They have they have a genuine demographic crisis with the population aging and declining. My question to you is 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 that good news for us or bad news for us? Yeah, we, we oscillate between thinking China is 10 feet tall, and then we say, well, no, we're wrong. It's only four feet tall. And the real answer is it's six feet, three inches. And you may quote me on that. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's somewhere in the in the middle. Uh, I, I'm no economist. I read and talk to a lot of economists who do follow the China situation. They have structural problems in terms of their indebtedness, real estate crisis, overproduction uh, in terms of... Uh, of their manufacturing capacity, demographics, all the things you described. Uh, they also have a substantial youth unemployment problem. 
which is uh, which are, are structural problems that they face. But I think it would be very unwise to accept the notion that China has peaked and it's on the way down and it's not going to be a problem. One, because it's a very resilient economy. Two, it has gone a long way to be a very innovative and entrepreneurial economy in its private sector, notwithstanding the fact that the government has interfered with the private sector and favored the state sector, the state-owned enterprises over the private sector. So I think it would be much too early to rule it out. And secondly, you cannot rule out the possibility that Xi Jinping will change his mind and unleash uh, a much a return to the form and opening effort that actually resulted in the double digit China growth that we saw over the last couple of decades. He changed his mind on zero COVID, showed that he could turn on a dime. He may decide that, that uh, he has to address these economic issues in order to maintain his grip on power. So far, whenever the choice has been between political control and economic reform, he's chosen political reform, political control. He may decide that over the long term, his political control is threatened if he doesn't address these economic challenges. So let me just ask you about that, because uh, that's a obviously we're all focused on President Xi, uh, just this issue you're talking about. Is there intelligence uh, that um, the hints or suggest that the balance between political control and economic opening um, is is something that President Xi might re-examine? We don't know. Uh, we'll see. Um, you know, we used to people say in the intelligence community, the hardest target is leadership intentions. What does the guy on the other side of the table really intend? It's a funny thing to say. It's, I think, a legacy of an intelligence community that believes only real intelligence you can rely on is the intelligence that you can steal. And it's very hard to steal intelligence about leadership intentions. But somebody like Xi Jinping, he's speaking and writing all the time. Part of it for a Western audience, part of it for a domestic audience. We hear most of it. So in some sense, you know, we should read what he says and take it seriously. But he has, in his standing committee of his Politburo, are loyalists. But some of these loyalists have a real record at the provincial level of economic uh, reform. So there, there is capability there to lead in a reform dire direction. Uh, Kevin Rudd, who's the Australian ambassador to the United States and a real China expert, at a panel uh, I witnessed the other day, pointed to the fact that they've decided to have the third party plenum, which is the one that talks about economic matters here uh, in uncharacteristically here in the next month or so. And he's raising the question of whether the reason that's been scheduled is for some kind of announcement of a change of direction on the economic piece. So we just have to wait and see. I've got a kind of a follow-up question uh, with regards to China. Um, the argument has been made um, in Congress among some Republicans, um, but also uh, uh, by others, about whether the investment in Ukraine against Russian uh, invasion is draining attention and resources away from Taiwan, that we ought to be locking in on Taiwan as the, the number one threat and uh, leave it to Europe to defend itself. Yeah, I think that's a, a pretty suspect argument. I mean, one of the questions, and again, you can get people up here who are more expert than I, but the nature of the conflicts, the real conflict in Ukraine and potential conflict in Taiwan are different. And the force requirements are different. For Taiwan, it's going to be much more an air and naval game, certainly for us, than it is the kind of ground forces game that you're seeing played out in Ukraine. So there's a real question about whether there is, in fact, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul uh, in terms of squandering. And now, at the same time, I will say there are some things that Taiwan has ordered for its own military that have been delayed mm -hmm. because of the need to meet the requirements, Ukraine, not just in Ukraine, but also the Middle East. Uh, but uh, I think if you what's interesting is if you talk to the Taiwanese, you know, those people who make that argument say the priority ought to be China because we ought to defend Taiwan 
and protect Taiwan against pressure from China. If you talk to the Taiwanese, they would say, you've got to help Ukraine to defeat Russia. Because if the Americans show that they're not willing to stand by the Ukrainians, that will be a message to the Chinese that the Americans probably won't stand behind Taiwan. Ukraine is a recognized state. Taiwan is this uh, sort of unusual status uh, since we recognize China as the leg legitimate the government and Beijing as the legitimate uh, government for China. So if you won't stand for the Ukrainians, you won't stand for the Taiwanese. So Taiwan is in some sense the biggest advocate for why we have to stand firmly with the Ukrainians. I want to ask you about one other aspect of our competition with China that came up in a in a, a congressional Capitol Hill forum that you and I participated in recently. And I was a little surprised to hear the genuine experts on this say that we are losing to losing the influence battle with China throughout the Southern Hemisphere, not just in Africa, which I was aware of, but also in South America and South Asia. What what should we as a country be doing differently to prevent that from happening? Well, part of it is, uh, Vin, we're, we're not showing up. A uh, year, maybe a year and a half ago, I heard an anecdote from a reliable source, talked about an African leader. An African leader said, let me tell you the difference between the United States and China in Africa. You Americans, you send an assistant secretary over here, assistant secretary of state, once a quarter, he or she flies in, spends the day, three or four hours on the ground, a few meetings, fly off, and we don't see him again for another three months. The very next week, the Chinese will be here with a delegation of 10 plus folks, including business, and they'll stay for a while and they'll do some deals. So China and Russia both have focused on uh, and enhanced their relations in Africa uh, and Latin America, and also in some sense in Southeast Asia, and particularly the Pacific Islands, in a way we have not invested. And with the Belt and Road Initiative, which is this big program by China to put money into infrastructure in the third world, it dwarfs what we are able to do in terms of our own resources. Um, and the, the irony is there is huge infrastructure needs in the global south. Russia, China is at least trying to meet them, and we don't seem to show up. We have instruments in the Development Finance Corporation and the Exim Bank, but they are under-resourced, uh, and they need to be used to leverage the private sector, which is really where the capital is for this kind of project. And we aren't doing that right now. There's an opportunity here because most of these countries would prefer to deal with American companies and European companies and uh, for friends and allies like Australia and Japan, because they know we will be fiscally responsible, environmentally responsible, will employ local labor, will meet local labor standards, and the Chinese won't. So they'd like to deal with us, but we don't give them an offer that they can say yes to. And this is an opportunity for us to work with friends and allies. Japan is very good at this. So are the Australians. So are the Europeans. We need to, and we're, be, I think, beginning to pull together in a common effort to make an offer that would meet uh, and beat, in some sense, what the Chinese can offer. Um, I think this will be one of the priorities for the Biden administration in a second term. I say that based on some conversations with Biden folks. Where Trump is on this, I do not know. We've got a number of questions here, and I've been filtering some in and um, want to get a few more. Um, one of the questions from one of our friends uh, coming to us online is, how should the U.S. best engage India um, as we compete and uh, uh, confront Russia, China, um, and uh, the Iranians? Well, India is a real opportunity for us. Uh, it is a country that we, uh, it is a democratic country. Uh, we share a lot of values uh, with India. It is a country net that ever since really the Clinton administration on forward, each successive administration has broadened and deepened our relationship with India. Uh, it in turn has been more and more concerned about China. They have their own border issues 
uh, with China that have flared up from time to time uh, and is more active, is also active and concerned and in some sense expanding its own area of, of, of interest to the Middle East, for example, uh, and into Southeast Asia. So they are a natural partner for us. And one of the things we've seen, for example, is uh, the Trump administration resurrected something called the Quad, which is Japan, India, the United States, and Australia. The Quad was started in the Bush administration to deal with the consequences of the tsunami that you may remember, which was a devastating impact in Southeast Asia. And it then sort of laid dormant. And the Trump administration, to its credit, pulled it out and, and, and started to use it as an instrument for coordinating policy among those four countries. Part of that being coordinating how we approach the China challenge. So I think India has a great role to play, but India will, we have to be, this is the kind of thing that we, I think, has to change our policy. We have to deal with friends and allies in a different way maybe than the stereotype uh, of, of the past. Used to be people would say U.S. leadership was the code name for U.S. dictate, dictat. You know, we'll decide what you think you ought to do, and we'll ask you to do it, and you'll do it, no questions asked. That doesn't work anymore. We're going to have to consult people, take their interests into account uh, before we make decisions, make decisions in a way that reflect a consensus. We particularly have to do that with India, because India is going to act out of its own sense of national interests. Where those converge with us, we should be able to work together. But we should recognize that at the same time, these are countries that do not want to choose between the United States and China and are going to try in some sense to have relations on both sides of the ledger. And isn't it the case that India really never made a choice between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War? They tried to play both sides of the fence? They tried try to play both sides of the fence, but I would say with a strong tilt to the Soviet Union, particularly in the security space and in terms of their defense industry. Um, one of the longstanding issues of debate in Washington going back almost a century is about the nature and extent of presidential power. You've got folks who read the Constitution, Article One, who will point to parts of it and say, oh, look, you know, Congress has got the power to declare war. Congress has got power of the Navy and the Army and, and the budget um, through the purse. Um, then you've got other folks, and Dick Cheney stands out as one of the, the louder, more articulate voices that say, wait a second, don't forget about the commander-in-chief power and the implied powers around it. Um, and we, this has gone back and forth um, with kind of efforts to rein in uh, presidents or not. It seems in the current era, it's become almost entirely situational based on partisanship. There was an incident, though, that... Um, Kind of caught attention of uh, senators in both parties, which was concern around Donald Trump's use of nuclear weapons. And uh, the uh, General Milley in his book talks specifically about steps he took to make sure that there was a, uh, a proper procedure in place so that Donald Trump couldn't wake up and, and launch missiles. Does this lead to any concern you might have about the nature and extent of presidential power? Uh, not so much. Uh, you know, the Constitution is interesting. It is given some powers in national security, foreign policy to the Congress, some powers to the president. It's a it's a it's a roadmap, if you will, or a prescription for struggle and competition between the pre Congress and the president for leadership in national security and foreign policy. And you see it play out over time. In time of crisis or war, power tends to gravitate towards the president. In times of peace, or particularly if the president has a war that doesn't go well, or is some kind of corruption scandal like Watergate, the Congress will then claw that power back and the balance will shift towards the Congress. This is really ingrained in our constitutional system. Uh, and I would say it works pretty well. It's part of the checks and balances that is the essence of our political system. The, the norms about uh, command, uh, chain of command, command and control of nuclear weapons are particularly pretty well established. There have been times where 
There have been periods of nervousness. There was some nervousness. You may remember during the Nixon administration in the run up to during the period when he was threat of impeachment and ultimately resigned from office. There's stories about how Jim Schlesinger, who was then Secretary of Defense at the time, excuse me, told his military authorities that if he got a call from the White House, they should ignore it and call him first. <laughs> uh, and I think Millie was talking about the same kind of thing. But I think for the moment, uh, I, I, I'm not that worried whether it's a President Biden or a President Trump in the next term. We've got another question from the audience. Um, what is the one area of potential conflict or crisis that does not receive the kind of attention that the Middle East or Ukraine is receiving right now that, that you would flag and say to the next administration, you're not thinking about this, but you should be? Well, it's a pretty long list. And one of the problems when you have as many crises as we have right now, it's very hard to look past crises and put in place policies that might avoid crises in the in the future. I think a lot of things people talk about is one of the things we've talked about here, the needs of the global south, the competition between Russia and China on the one hand and the United States on the other for influence in the global south. That's certainly one. A lot of attention going to the Arctic, which because of global warming is opening up in terms of com commercial lanes and the like. Uh, and uh, the, it's an area where Russia, of course, has a strong presence. So do some of our uh, Scandinavian allies. Uh, and China is, is, uh, claims to be a non-contiguous but nonetheless interested party, partner in the Arctic. So that's an area where we have to focus. Uh, I think this whole area of technology, what the private sector is doing and the implications of that for national security and for our defense industry, we're slow to take that into account. We probably do not have the kinds of expertise in the government that we need to deal with these kinds of technologies and to establish frameworks for the private sector that maximize the benefits and minify, minimize the, the dangers and risks and, and manage those risks. So those are the ones I would th think about. I also would say that um, I don't think we're paying enough attention to demographic changes and how that's going to impact power balances over the long term. And those are some democratic demographic changes, for example, in China, but also in terms of Japan and Europe and the like. So there's a lot out there. Would climate change be on your list? Climate change is getting a lot of attention. One of the questions is that's that's an, there are a lot of areas of overlap, I would say, or areas where I think whether it's a Biden or a Trump administration, doesn't much matter. The policy is going to be largely the same. And I would say, for example, China policy is one example of that. Climate is one, and energy policy, I think, is where there will be great divergence between the two parties and between the two candidates. So I think it's getting a lot of attention under Biden. We'll see how much attention it would get if there's a Trump presidency. We've got a number of questions here about um, Israel and Gaza. Um, and uh, Let's give you the full package. <laughs> um, one, one set of questions are really about uh, how you see the current leadership in Israel leading to a settlement in Gaza um, and perhaps this global deal that's been talked about with Saudi Arabia. Is Netanyahu capable of the big diplomatic stroke that might be necessary, or is that the wrong question? Um, the second series of questions have been raised relate to uh, what's known as a two-state solution. Um, and the question is, is that an actual proposal? Is it actually viable? Um, and would the Israeli leadership sign on to it? It seems to be favored by columnists and, and talking heads, but there's not really much of a sign that Israel is going to uh, give this much thought. So two sets of questions about uh, what's going on in Israel related to Gaza and the region. So uh, could Netanyahu accept that kind of deal, uh, a deal that which, for example, would lead to something he's long sought, which is reconciliation between Israel and, and Saudi Arabia? 
but at the cost of having to acknowledge or accept the notion of a of a Palestinian state and some kind of roadmap for getting there. Yes, he could. Uh, he could probably bring probably bring down his government because right wing parties would probably leave that government. He could then try to restructure his government so to bring in more of the centrist policies, uh, parties that would support that kind of policy. Or there might the government might fall and there might be new elections and we would have a new set of new government uh, in, in place. So it could. The question is whether he will. And the question is, how long will he stay in power? At some point, there will be an effort to bring to account accountability for what happened on October 7th. Um, I think those are questions that in some sense we leave to the people of Israel. Israel is a democracy and uh, it is a very robust political system and it is up to the Israeli people to decide who's going to lead them going forward. Netanyahu's views are not out of step with public opinion if you look at polls. Uh, Two-state solution is no longer popular in Israel be given what happened on October 7th. And Putin and, and Netanyahu senses that, and that's really why he's positioning himself on that issue the way he is. So I think we'll we'll have to see where that sorts out in terms of of uh, of Israeli politics. The grand bargain you talk about is has a two state solution as part of it. Two state solution actually was the solution in the UN resolution that established the state of Israel. Back in 47, 48, 49, I've forgotten which year it was, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, it called for a two state solution. And Israel at the time accepted a two state solution. And then, of course, the Arab countries invaded Israel. And the Palestinians have had various offers over the years for a terms of a Palestinian state, which they have offered by in Israel and rejected or not taken up by the Palestinians. Uh, the problem with the two-state solution and the critics of the two-state solution is anytime you try and articulate or develop an idea for some other way to bring stability and prosperity to the Middle East and to deal with the Palestinian question, nobody's come up with an alternative that seems to work. So, you know, the two-state solution is the little engine that could but hasn't yet done it. Um, there, there's a, um, a question about uh, the countries in the former Soviet Union. We talk a lot about Russia. We talk about Ukraine. What about Georgia and 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 countries kind of on the periphery of the former Soviet Union or part of the former Soviet Union? Do you have a sense of of their kind of geopolitical uh, status and whether they represent opportunities or? Uh, possible uh, vulnerabilities for Europe and NATO? It's a very mixed bag. Uh, take Moldova, very small country. Uh, part of its territory is actually occupied by uh, Russian forces. And Putin is making threatening noises about Moldova. Uh, and many people think is preparing the ground for some kind of in invasion of Moldova, certainly increasing pressure on Moldova. Moldova has had a leadership that has tried it to move west, and of course, that's anathema to Putin. Armenia at this present time is trying to move away from the Russian sphere. It is trying to reduce, for example, its uh, participation in the security organization that that Russia established in the wake of the breakup of the Soviet Union, and while still maintaining economic ties with Russia. And in some sense, Russian forces will remain on Armenian territory. So it's a very tricky balance <clears throat> that Armenia is trying to play. And Georgia, unfortunately, is going into a situation where, while well, its formal policy is to become part of the EU and NATO, it has uh, the, the Georgia Dream Party, which is in, con in control of Georgia and has been for some time, has now adopted the legislation very much like the Russian legislation that says the Foreign Agents Act, that anybody that journalist or NGO organization that gets money from non-Georgian sources is a foreign agent, which is, of course, a kiss of death in terms of domestic politics and their ability to, to operate in Georgia. 
And many people think that is a harbinger of a movement towards Russia. So these countries are, you know, it are in, it's, it's really difficult to circumstances to navigate for all of them. And each of them in, are in some sense different. There are um, uh, questions here about uh, whether diplomacy um, is getting the short shrift. And this question is related to another one about the 2015 agreement involving the U.S., Iran, and, and Russia and allies with regards to reducing the Iranian um, um, Iranian uranium supplies uh, by 97% that were going to be targeted for nukes. And Donald Trump came into office and said this was a flawed agreement. It, it, it neglected a number of uh, terrorist threats uh, by Iran, which 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 is true. Um, and then he terminated it and said they'll get a better agreement. Better agreement never happened. And now Iran is racing towards uh, collecting that uranium and building nuclear weapons. In hindsight, was the termination of the agreement with Iran a mistake? Hard to say. Very hard to say. Um, the 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 evolution of that and the discussion of that was sort of twofold. The criticism, as I remember in 2015, uh, from Republicans, but also from some Democrats. If you talk to Joe Lieberman, he was death on that agreement. Uh, and the reason was twofold. One, because the limitations on Iran's nuclear program all provided for sunsetting. And the concern that many people had was that by accepting that agreement and accepting those restrictions and that they would sun sunset, you are actually legitimating a Iranian nuclear program that ov over time would lead to Iran getting a nuclear weapon. The credit, the the answer that to, that the defenders of the agreement gave was, well, that agreement was in the context of a U.S. policy that made it clear that we would act militarily if Iran moved towards a nuclear weapon. But that was the way to solve that problem. You can decide how you feel about that. The other thing the administration, I think, Obama administration failed to do is they did not pair their nuclear agreement with a strategy that was adequately resourced to deal with the problem that was upsetting the region, which was not so much the nuclear problem, but all these proxy forces that right. Iran right. was supporting. And we've now seen range full flower with the Houthis and the Hamas and Hezbollah and those uh, uh, forces, proxy forces in Iraq and Syria. So it was the failure to address those two things that really was go caused a lot of people, Republicans and some Democrats, unease with that. Again. Yes, and I, and I think those are all legitimate questions and they've been raised and debated. The question here was about whether um, we're more exposed to Iranian threat now because the Iranians are rushing towards nuclear weapons. And so now we not only have the existing problems, but we also now have uh, the threat of a, of a nuclear uh, armed um, and well-equipped Iran, which is what the agreement was aimed at. It was, we're gonna take out this one. Well, thing. it was what it was aimed at. The question that was raised was, was, is it what the agreement would have achieved? Secondly, the Trump administration thought that they could, should, increase the pressure on Iran to both get a better nuclear deal and deal with these other proxy threats to, to stability in the region. The Biden administration came in and said, we're going to get back into the nuclear deal. And what we learned is that it takes two. The Biden administration wanted to get back into the agree agreement, and clearly the, the Iranians did not. Uh, and they are moving incrementally to restore their nuclear program. They're beginning now to talk publicly about the possibility that they will get nuclear weapons. We will see. This, this would be a red line for declared policy of the United States and a red line for the declared policy of Israel and something that would probably provoke other countries in the region to want to have their own nuclear weapons. I can't imagine a situation where Saudi Arabia and UAE and maybe Turkey and others are going to assist still and not have their own nuclear capability if Iran gets nuclear weapons. And the question is, is that a more stable Middle East or not? We've got a couple questions here on the theme of um, what is the national security policy of the Republican Party? 
we're heading to a convention, obviously this summer. Um, and there's a reference here to Ronald Reagan and what used to be the conservative national security policy. Can you identify what is the conservative national uh, security policy today? Well, you know, uh, in some sense, people are insisting on a unanimity within the Republican Party that we don't seem to insist on with the Democratic Party. I mean, Democrats are all over the map on foreign policy, as are Republicans today. And the, the vigorous debates, in some sense, are within the parties rather than between the parties these days. Um, the uh, I think there, there are a couple trends that not only cross so there, let me say it this way. So there's a debate within the Republican Party. There are the Reaganites, of which probably I would be one. I would say Reaganites and Bushites on one hand, sort of traditional national security Republicans. And then there's the MAGA movement reflected by Donald Trump. Um, my friend Matt Kroenig has written a book that basically argues that there's more commonality between the two wigs than you would think. Uh, some examples of that. Uh, I think everybody recognizes, whether you're a Reaganite or a MAGA, that China's a problem. And the China challenge is real and serious and needs to be addressed. And oddly enough, I think whether it's a President Biden or a President Trump coming up here in January 2025, you're going to see a lot of continuity on China policy, uh, wh whoever is elected, as there was a lot of continuity in China policy moving from the Trump to the Biden administration. Um, there, the, the falling away about support for free trade, I think, is both pretty universal within the Republican Party. Both wings is also shared by the Democrats, most Democrats as well. Right. Uh, I think you're going to find there's a consensus, again, that you got to do something on the border. Again, I think that's not only unites the Republican Party, I think it unites most of the Democrats. There's going to be disagreements about what to do about immigration policy. But the notion that we got to have control of our borders, I think, is something that's going to be fairly strong. I think there is a commitment in the Republican Party to be strong national defense. Yes. The question is, what do you use it for? And that's a d debate uh, between those who are more inter interventionist and those who basically are much more, in some sense, isolationist, but who will nonetheless say, as Ronald Reagan said, you need a strong defense in order to deter bad guys from doing things that would otherwise require you to go to war. So I think it's a very, very mixed picture. I think that's an overlooked uh, debate that's taken place in the Republican Party for a long time. My perception of Reagan was just exactly what you described it as being. But I always thought that the Bushes, who I admire greatly and supported strongly, were much more interventionist than Reagan. So there was that division between even the president and his vice president, future president. Yeah, the question is, how would react? Would Reagan have reacted to 9-11? Yeah. And I can't imagine that Ronald Reagan, after the United States had been attacked, and with the intelligence community telling him that the Al-Qaeda were planning a series of mass casualty attacks, some of which might involve nuclear weapons, and that seemed to be coming out of <laughs> Afghanistan, I don't believe Ra Ronald Reagan would just sat at the desk in the face of that kind of intelligence. Um, well, Mr. Hadley, thank you so much for joining us. We very much appreciate it. Um, and uh, Vin, do you want to have a closing word? Or two? No, I just want to say it's a personal pleasure as well as a professional pleasure to welcome you to the Humphrey School. And if there's never, ever another opportunity, we'd love to have you come back sometime. Love to do it. Nice to be with you both. Thanks for Just give me one second. I want to just give a shout out to a couple of programs we've got coming up. Um, we run a, a program called the Certificate and Election Administration. It's the largest training program online for folks who want to get involved in election administration. National conference coming up Monday, May 20th. You can get uh, access to that online it's from 10 to 12 30 central time washington post reporter james homan will be joining us uh june 5th at noon central time um if you've enjoyed this program it'll be available both on youtube as a podcast in one to two days and if you uh registered you'll get a, a link to that um and as with all of our programs we bring this to you as part of our service if you'd like to support it we'd welcome that 
Um, so once again, thank you, Mr. Hadley. We really appreciate it. My good friend, Vin Weber, and thanks to all of you for joining us.